ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a brand new podcast here at the RGM uh, studios. Um, it's exciting times. It's always exciting times, and it's great to be back on the podcast with an amazing guest. Just before, just to get the paperwork out of the way, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we here at RGM like to delve into the grassroots music industry and beyond and find interesting people to speak to within it. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we've got an amazing guest. We've got Dean Fairhurst from Standing Man. Hi, mate. How are you doing? You all right? I'm very good, thank you, and uh, thanks for having me on. You're very welcome, mate. You're very welcome. I'm, I'm, in, I'm intrigued by you, Dean. Uh, <laughs> you've got this big, long story and history and music that I'm excited to introduce the RGM people to. Uh, and just, I know you, your album, as we're recording this, your album's just dropped today. Brand new album. Uh, a few funny stories that I'm, uh, and uh, topics I'm going to bring up around the uh, album in a bit, just to tease people. So hang around, people. You're in for a ride on this one, ladies and gentlemen. All right. So I did. So so if, if anybody's new to Dean or Standing Man, introduce yourself to us, mate. What's it all about? Well, my name's Dean first. I'm a, I'm the lead singer, songwriter of Standing Man. Mm. Um, we started just sort of out of the pandemic mm. era. Did a little bit of an album, recorded that, and and uh, I I had a vision of it sort of previously, but before we started the ball rolling, but um, yeah, I started writing quite quickly for it. Uh, then we started to see what the the live performance would be like. So played one or two sort of shows supporting yeah. some up and coming artists, yeah, nice. um, and then formulated from that. I always think that you know trying to find how it works with a with a group of people live is a good starting point. Yeah. Um, and then sort of par- parallel to that was also the, the structure of writing. I wanted to come straight out with with an album and, and a body of work that, that tells a story. You know, well, so- a lot of people started to write more in the pandemic because of a fuck all else to do, basically. Weren't yeah. They? Yeah, exactly. and, and, and we've, you know, our, our podcast started over 150 weeks ago during right. the pandemic as well, when we wanted to speak to people and find out what people are up to. And my biggest fear was we were going to have loads of albums come out describing the pandemic. It's not like that, is it? Like, no, the end of the no, world no. and all that bollocks. <laughs> no, it was more, it was an escape from that, I think. Yeah. You, know, so you had to dig deeper a little bit into your own psyche and all the experiences and all those things to find an escape, which was cathartic, it's cathartic in, in the, in the, just in the process of, of creating, I think. Yeah. Uh, that's why, how I use it sort of a drug in some respects well a- away from all the terrible things that happened in the pandemic and people getting ill and that kind of stuff it, it yeah. wasn't, wasn't all that bad for everybody Pe- no. pe- people got time to themselves a little bit more people got had time to try different things people we were told by the fucking government that we had to retrain if you're a creative person and all that kind of bullshit <laughs> yeah. we had to deal with didn't we and all that kind of stuff yeah 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 uh, and some good stuff has come out of it you know obviously you know pay homage to the people that uh, you know, we're ill through it and all that kind of stuff. But uh, away from that, you know, a lot of creative things happened and people fought back against those messages we got from above, uh, like the government telling us that we should be doing proper jobs and not, uh, you know, reskill and, you know, work behind a bar and just, you know, just do the normal type of things, which I fucking hated that side of the messages that were coming from the government. My yeah, it, 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 it was because it's just so out of touch and it's not anything yeah. new. Yeah. Rather than getting them all political about it, but it's yeah. not anything new, which is sort of, I, 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 I was glad that they said that because it really shows, you know, that side yeah. of our civilization. Yeah. Um, the differences more. You don't really have to dig and go. Ooh, oh, did they really get us? <laughs> they don't. <laughs> yeah. Clearly, yeah. they don't. Yeah. And the fact that they don't know how worthy arts is, yeah. the art world is. And it is, it's imperative. It's imperative for, for our existence. It, for, it's imperative for culture. It's imperative for 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 getting through our times, getting mm-hmm. through the good times, remembering things. It's yeah. all, all music's nostalgia, isn't it? So you, you know, and you and and of course you, you're gonna remember bad times and you're gonna remember good times and, and that's the process of life and having a soundtrack to that is uh imperative yeah I no, I, I get it and just just to linger on this uh you know like moving on from all that kind of shit the uh the the, the government and you know governments you know you know yeah they're all fucking wrong aren't they the, you know you, yeah 
if you just look back in history. And they have kind of shown that played the cards, aren't they, with that kind of stuff. And they do try and take money away from the arts and the creative industries and the music venues. And if they if they can get rid of something first, they'll they'll attack our industry, won't they? Um, which... Britain is in that state, really, yeah. where you know everyone's going, oh fuck, the music in uh, the music venues are uh, the depleting by the minute. Um, and there's no infrastructure being put in place by by ultimately the people in power at the moment, yeah. and um, and how they foresee what the future holds. It seems like the 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 running around like fucking headless chicken. So yeah, um, I think <laughs> you, you've you've got to fight against it, and I think artists fight against it in in yeah. any way they possibly can, just by the ability to to keep digging and striving and, and creating and, and putting music out in the world now. So then uh, I, I suppose it, in dark times, what comes after it is, is always, uh, it's always interesting to see from, from artists around the world and yeah. uh, what they come up with. So I think it's maybe just a part of, of, of that process. I, uh, I, I, if, if you look at it with like a, you know, uh, you know, just looking back to the punk era, you know that those times were yeah. bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A certain kind of era when things were depressing and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so it can be um, uh, a silver lining, really, uh, it, or it could be. Uh, and the there seems to be a lot of people fighting back and having a voice now and coming up with albums and like the K's uh, this week of you know going yeah, yeah, yeah. album with the Liber Libertines and that kind of stuff. So like like bands yeah. that like really, really just progressed over the last couple of years and they can they can still do it. Uh, there's light at the end of the tu tunnel when 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 they try and knock us down. And I, I just love that fighting spirit around the music industry. I just think that nothing's going to stop them, really. Yeah, it's fighting the systems, isn't it, in place? Yeah. That's, that's, whether it's from a political point of view and yeah. in this in this realm, it's certainly there's, there's bands out there that are grafting to get recognition for the music. Yeah. Um, and it's great, you know, it's great to, to, to see... People gate crashing the charts and all that stuff for the case, um, but more importantly, it's 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 putting platforms in there to keep keep creating, mm. keep putting out music, keep keep developing your skills as an artist, and, and making it into something that's interesting enough for for it to uh, to affect people. So yeah. yeah, that's the escape from it all. All the rest of the bullshit is, is <laughs> um, gets dealt with, you yeah. know, by having, having the ability to, to to put a record on or. Yeah, I'll listen through it to get you through your life, I suppose. Right. Yeah, well, just let's rewind a bit. Let, let's uh, zoom out a little bit. So, what, so where, where do you call home, Dean? Where Where are you based? Uh, currently in Warrington, oh, uh, yeah. in between Liverpool and Manchester. So, oh, yeah. we're the oh. bastard children of uh, Manx and Scousers. <laughs> nice, nice. And did you grow up in Warrington? Originally? Yeah, 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 yeah. A little little village called Burton Wood. Oh, nice. Um, this is about three second names throughout the whole village. <laughs> uh, so, but yeah, it was very so, and it's it's sort of it's on the cusp of um, of Warrington, on the outskirts, just in between Warrington and a place called Saint Helens. Yeah, and uh, a little bit more countryside. Yeah, but it's, it's good. I've been there once. I went to watch BDI there once at Parole. Is it Parole? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember that when I was that, that were a messy one. I had a good, I had a good drink around town in Warrington that day. That it, it was a nice big rugby town, isn't it? Yeah, big rugby league yeah. town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, what what was it like for you, like growing up in a smaller town than these big cities that you see on the outskirts of your little place you call home? Uh, the the posit the positives were that you know it was you're not too far distant away from sort of countryside and yeah. And, uh, Bit of nature, I suppose, but then in in other respects, it is a little bit secluded. Um, you, there's not a great deal going on, you know. If you live a little bit closer to Manchester, or Liverpool, you you have to travel. So yeah, well, growing up and and getting to the age where uh, where you're heading out and chasing chasing the opposite sex and all that stuff. So um, yeah. you know it it was it. It was a, it was a, this was quite a lot of industrial things. So, right. I think in that element of uh, boredom or the importance of boredom drives you to 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 find escapes in whatever that is. And, and that was uh, music came quite quickly as the as the forefront of my mind. How quickly? How how old were you when you 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 realised you've got this thing inside you that's burning that I need to do to create something? I um so it's funny really. My my father was a 
used to work down the pit. Then he then he became a, a rugby player, funny enough. Mm. A professional rugby player playing at Wigan and, and uh, Warrington as captain at Warrington, I think. Mm. And then uh, and my mother was a hairdresser, so no nothing creative. I have like a, a, a brother who, who is who works in the uh, the acting industry and, and he's a theatre director. Mm. So we're very both creative. So it's strange to think how that happened. And then I I was we were both me and my brother were both playing rugby at a younger age as well, as he said, like Warrington, not being a rugby team rugby sort of uh, town and then so at the age of about 16 I think but before that I was a bit obsessed with music so I'd always be stealing records off my brother or the good thing that what my parents did have is that they had a good taste in music so mm. my father would he, he sang in an Irish band that was that's the only connection I have from from my family that anyone would do from a performance point of view yeah. um, he sang like sort of in an Irish band singing a lot of traditional Irish songs and stuff like that. So I'd see him at a younger age playing in the pubs and stuff like that. Um, and then I I, I, I was just, uh, I would hear a lot of the music coming out of the, the car radio or at home and stuff like that. So I got, I started to get an obsession with that. Then the Beatles how, how, old, how old were you then? What just to... I, from, from a really young age, I was, I was sort of, uh, uh, introduced to to music at like, like uh, five or six maybe seven yeah. or something. little memories of having little records around when you had like vinyl players stuff like that mm -hmm. all those newer style vinyl players they're all plastic and a little bit shit um and some, someone stole it i remember someone stole it it was like a big thing um and then so so then my brother was into music so he would he was he's a few years older than me, so he was the one. He, he had money to buy records, so I'd always steal his and, and do all those things. So, and then when I started to go to, to high school, um, I, I became more and more obsessed. So it just grew and grew, and I wanted to absorb music in the sense that we had like sort of tape players and the story I tell quite often, which I think most kids did in those days, where you'd have the sort of headphones through your sleeve, have your tape recorder, you'd be swapping the tapes the cassettes with your friends at school and, and just have my headphone in my ear lean, leaning on the on the side while I was in class and, and you know the teacher wouldn't know I'd just be listening to fucking tracks all day and different albums and um and then I I, I met um I got friendly after a couple of years in high school with with a friend called uh, Louis Menga and uh, we became very close just through the connection of music and we were start. We we just. I don't. I can't. I don't think there was an exact point where we were like, right, let's start the band. Yeah. It was like, oh, let, we got connected over the music. We were both obsessed with the Beatles. Both obsessed with Rolling Stones. Love Dylan. All those things, and blues and all that stuff. So, we we were learning at the same time. He'd learned a little bit of guitar before because his father played um, like flamenco guitar. So then. I I sort of mithered. Uh, my parents mum bought me a an acoustic card uh, acoustic guitar down in Cardiff because my brother was going to university there. Anyway, I got it, and then I just sort of, we just locked ourselves in a bedroom from then on, and started writing songs before we could even really play. It was it was more about the 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 the, the magic of of songwriting mm. and the actual songs of how how does that something that someone's created there change you something inside you listen to it and it affects you and you're like fuck i want to do that that seems ace and then you get obsessed with the documentaries constantly you know watching it the only thing i would watch is all documentaries of films so then um for, what, for, what were the people like uh, around you at school when you were getting into music was was that like were you on the outskirts of society with that kind of stuff or, or yeah definitely yeah it, it, it was sort of a time where music was getting bigger and it was uh, time and like strokes were coming in i suppose and, and then you know libertines and arctic monkeys and stuff that's when we were just getting older but at the time in high school there wasn't really that many people into music they were into into the type of music that we were being attached to mm -hmm. it was more like hip-hop and and rap which which i, I listened to as well mm -hmm. i sort of enjoyed a lot of that i think when i was really younger i went through a phase thinking i was fucking eminem for one at one point <laughs> nice uh, no no i wasn't doing any rapping I'm going to show you with that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it was just a, it was just the, the obsession came quite quick, and then then it was just more about absorbing as much as possible, you know, 
And um, and when you're going through your teenage years, it's like, you know, it's, it's you against the world, isn't it? And that gives you a little bit of an anchor to mean something in the world and you mean something in the world. I don't know what it is. It's the magic of music that yeah. people can obviously talk about to the end of the day to try and understand. But I'm still on that journey of uh, of trying to understand it, I suppose. Yeah. But, you know, um, and then I, I, I carried on in, in that journey of delving deeper in influences of the bands that I like. So a lot of sort of the Afro-American music and all the blues and how that the resurgence of that and the history of it always fascinated me and um yeah i'm still on that journey i'm still on that that obsessive train so to speak wanting more and more i, think I am as well you know i did like you know, like after my band split up many many years ago yeah um it never really leaves you if you've got that kind of personality and i, I can remember getting a I, I can remember the lighting bolt that got me into music somebody passed me a tape we um uh, what where's your song? Shake Maker, something like that. Yeah, a really old one with a tape on before. Definitely, maybe come out. And said, yeah, have a listen to that on a tape. You know, back in olden days when that was just yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> and it's just it. You know, I, I can remember it vividly. Just like fuck, you know, this is good. This it, it changes your life. Uh, yeah, the the power of that to have that and want to want to you know offer that to other people. That's just amazing, isn't it? It's just a yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no, no, and 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 I, and I think the bands obviously that I got obsessed with, they were like I, I, you could see there was a connection there, saying oh they could do it. Certainly, like with bands like Oasis that were come from like a working class background. It's like it, it's that that incites the the idea that oh I can actually do that then can I? Or is there a chance that I can do that? So you're gonna fucking follow it. So it's all their fault, you know what I mean? So. <laughs> yeah, it's all their fault. Yeah, blame them, blame them. Uh, <laughs> so so what was like, so uh, so you met your mate, getting into music, you know, developing yeah. these things, you get your guitar. Um, when was the like, first time you played a few chords together and wrote a tune? T tell us through how that happened. And, and what was the name uh, of it? You know what, I was, think I, was, I was thinking about this the other day because, um, because I, I seen him quite recently, uh, Louis, and then we like, structured the band together. Um, but we we were we play predominantly in his, and we were sort of learning together. And we'd be like, "Oh, I've learned this chord. Do you know this chord? And he'd show me something. I show him something." And but we had like uh, like a little tape recorder, mm. so we put like cassettes in and record it. And um, you know, we record over the track, and then we'll find a riff. So we we did that pretty pretty soon on after realizing that we were learning how to play instruments. So we started writing some tunes straight away. Um, and then obviously at the time, you're going to show like your family or whatever, or you're showing his family, and they'd be like really sportive, going, oh, that sounds really good, you know, carry it on. So we we we, we quickly just started writing, 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 writing different things, trying, you know, just learning the, learning the trade, so to speak. And then uh, we we got into to gigging. I think our first gig was... Oh, no, our first gig, after we sort of put the band together, we got like a lad called Adam in playing the bass. We had originally we had like a, a drummer called Chris who he played. Neither of them could fucking play either. <laughs> but uh, they weren't as in, they wanted to be in it because it always sounds something new and young, but they weren't in it as much as as me and Louis would. So, so yeah. we obviously sort of drove that. And um we did it at the first gig. It was from the bass player's mum had organised or got us a gig in, in a pub in fucking, what's it called? Um, someone just, it's on the way to Manchester. And anyway, it was it, we, we turned up to the show and it was like, we set up the, the equipment. Everyone's all a bit nervous. The drummer's fucking nervous as well. <laughs> he was always nervous. We're trying to not show it. And uh, we played the first set, and I remember it was the roughest fucking pub you've ever been in, Gene. Like, <laughs> yeah. It was like all the scallies around playing pool. Halfway through the set, one of the scallies, just the one who thought he was the artist, I suppose, comes over and is going like, turn that shit off. And, I'm like, <laughs> and like, I was like, I laughed it. I loved it. Because it was people that were watching it and people enjoying it. And then, you know, this sort of kerfuffle going on with <laughs> these scallies. And um I remember the drummer not wanting to go on. He didn't want to go on in the second set because his, his ass had gone. I was like, no, it's fucking good. Come on, we've got to do it. We've got to go through it and fight through it. 
And I think for like a good few years, that was the most money we got paid for a gig. It's oh. like, I think it's about 800 quid or something like that <laughs> for like a couple of hours a set. But then um, I, I, I I quickly got got uh, intrigued. Were it just, were it just covers and that, by the way? That, was that, was that, yeah. like I think it was a big mix of, co- mix of covers yeah. and mix of uh, our, our own songs just to see yeah. how they go. Yeah. They probably were a little bit shit, but um, you're yeah. supposed to be, I think. You know? Yeah, you are, yeah. But there was something in there. I remember writing some songs that that I fe- eventually started getting sort of notoriety here in 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 Warrington and and in Newtonley Willows, where we started getting a fan base, and they they started to travel around with us. Then it, we we just take coachfuls of, of of fans from from like Newton, Warrington up up to Manchester or to Liverpool, and even down London and Everett, Sheffield, and all that stuff. So, and um, we. Because it's because you you have to be those duplicit that duplicitous person in in being a businessman in the industry. Even yeah. then, you have to be it. But you, you wasn't caring about that. You had no fucking idea of what that is. It was just more about let's just go and play. What, so, was, that, what was that band called? Uh, that band was called Sly Diggs. Oh, was that Sly Diggs? Oh, okay. I've got them yeah. to talk about in a little bit because they they progressed a little bit, didn't they? Yeah. No. No. We did well, <laughs> but that's how the starting point was. Like yeah. the trajectory was 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 strange we went through we got ourselves in some funny situations but yeah yeah it was great yeah so, so funny situations what kind of funny situations oh, I fucking hell. there's so many, so <laughs> many. um i we well when when we sort of really started to get good yeah. so to speak we realized that we needed more equipment and yeah. rehearsal equipment recording whatever it was um and the best way to do it, we found, was you you would you would get more money and you would be treated better in in, in doing tours in Ireland. Mm-hmm. Funny enough, and it was, it was at the point where we were still doing covers in the set because you because you go to Ireland and you're asking for X amount for you know a couple of hours a set. You need to fill out that set, so you can't really play you know two three even longer. Sometimes we play um, of our own music. We just didn't have that much music and then you know people are not going to sit for three hours and listen to music they don't hear they've never heard before so so we, we'd mix up a set and then we, we did a few tours in ireland and, and that was that was like the hamburg time for for the band uh how, you know, how did you, how did you find out there's opportunities in ireland come from coming from Warrington and, and actually making that happen because you think, know it's not cheap to do those type of things if you if you're going uh if you're going overseas if you're nipping over to ireland over there um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, as, it was good. Yeah, it was good money. Yeah, yeah, it was good. It was, it was, it was good money. So, I, and there was, we, we, I think we were still using the internet. Might have been my, my space then. I think it was just after that. But people had email us or and ask us to do, and then, and my father was traveling over there as well. So we had sort of little bits of connections, trying out pubs, and it was that usual thing of parents, you know, trying to help out. So that that was a major part. Um, and then you know. We, we we were just touring around there. We, we'd rent a, a or we I think the drummer bought a van and <clears throat> like a long wheelbase van. We'd have like a shelf in the middle, the gear underneath, and we'd sleep on the top. And we'd just travel around busking in Dublin. And then when you busk in Dublin, people will come and see you and and say, "Oh, come and play at my at uh, my venue. Do this." And just as is the beautiful nature of uh, of the Irish, they're always sort of welcoming. And, and we'd always invite us and we'd get invited to people's houses and you stay there one night, we'd go to showers in this place and we'll get a hotel now and again if we earned a little bit more money, you know. And we lived off like fucking cooked chickens and Guinness for a for a for a good few weeks, you know. <laughs> and it was it was a time where we really cemented our abilities to to have tightness and playing together and yeah. and enjoying just being young, really. Getting yourself in situations that are a bit crazy, I remember. Playing in a place just yeah, yeah that, that's what I'm getting to. Tell us about a crazy situation, man. <laughs> I remember playing. I remember playing in a place just outside Dublin. I won't mention, yeah. but the guy there, he picked us up from busking, and he was saying, "You right, you're great, you guys." And he he liked to drink. You could see, you know, he had those sort of signs, telltale signs. And he was like, "Be be careful a little bit," but oh no. That's, that was it. We, we did the show, smashed the show, and halfway through the show, there's there's a very sort of strange looking character watching, and I'm seeing him through the show. So we do the first hour, and he's stay he's he's still watching us, not really 
getting involved in like the crowd because they were like the older people and they all be on like popping all sorts of stuff and getting drunk and it was like a crazy scene. This place out of Dublin that we've never been to before, packed out place. And I kept seeing in the corner of my eye this guy and he was just very just watching the whole set, not moving, very very quiet. And then halfway at the set, he sort of comes over and goes, "English boy, very good, very good." Uh, then walked off <laughs> and I was like fucking thought nothing of it and then the owner came up and he was like fucking hell what did he say to you that bloke what did he say to you and I, I said oh, no he just said the set was good he was like he's part of uh, some very you know very naughty the sort of places in, in with regards to the IRA sort of uh, thing. Uh, and, um, and the Bass player at the time, we changed bass players, and his family, have, you know, had had some like crazy stories and beautiful stories of of those fighting back for for the Irish because he's got a lot of Irish family over there, and mm. and it was just in those moments where you you're you're lost in the excitement of it, and then you know right. someone just tells you something, and you're like, like, no, but it was good to <laughs> good that they enjoyed the show, I suppose. Yeah, nice one. Yeah, good work. You won them round. Yeah, no, no, and and you know we we would be living in the back of all. Well, the vans and traveling around and, and chasing girls and doing all the things that you do as at a young age. And yeah, there's loads I can't tell. No, oh, fair enough, fair enough. Well, that's all right. That's all. But it's all it's all for the history books and it's all it's all for the book one day. Eh? Yeah, mate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you know, the, you, you mentioned Sly Diggs there because uh, when I, uh, I was doing a bit of research on you and that, you know, just having a, yeah, trying to do me interview bit and that. Uh, yeah. Obviously, uh, you know, the headline from uh, is Sly Diggs supported many big legendary bands. So before yeah. to to that side of things, how did you progress as a band to being an opportunity to supporting the likes of the Who, Def Leppard, Liam Gallagher, that kind of stuff? Yeah, um, we, we we just grafted like like you've got to do in this day and age, and yeah, you know, I've done for a long time, and it's it's just gigging, and you've got to keep producing music, keep putting out certain music, doing the 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 video things and putting stuff online. And it was more of like the conveyor belt of creating. So we were enjoying ourselves and we were putting stuff out online. And, and we, we went from like one sort of tour at like a toilet tour of the UK. And within like six months. Was that we like were, a, was that like a self-funded uh, headline tour that you'd booked yourself or did you have? Yeah, people? no, I think, I, I think like, like a local sort of promoter mm. and put it, put us on and then, you know, a few of the gigs were good in the local areas, and then we played like a place in Doncaster, and the fucking sound engineer didn't turn up, but we're all like <laughs> bastard, you know, fucking smashing the gaff up, and uh, and we went from that of going this little bit soul destroying, you know, going playing into an empty room, and and then you know playing to a, a room that's quite full, and people are like wanting to see more to play into an empty room, and then six months later we got offered to play. I think the first gig we did was it was Echo Arena, but. But it, it came from from just posting out online. So we, we posted a video. I think it was a song called mm. "Stiff Up a Lip," and uh, they and someone that worked with the management of Sin, with the Who's management had seen a seen a video out on Twitter and then passed it to a few people and they liked it and then they got in touch with us and and then they they wanted to come and see let's, us. Let's just hang around that a little bit. So, yeah. so that's very rare to hear those type of stories, isn't it? Do you know where? Right. When somebody puts a video out and it gets picked up by yeah a bit these big massive bands management team and they want yeah. to sit with you and that kind of stuff they they usually have they're quite loyal to the, the labels and that kind of stuff and they put little bit of smaller bands on from the labels and that kind of stuff don't they yeah generally I suppose how, yeah how did uh, tell us more about the mechanics of that uh, if you can yeah so so I think it was they they passed it on so the the whose management got interested in us of they were they were not necessarily as my understanding that they were not necessarily looking for any artists to invest in because you know they they were managing like the who ub40 uh, judas priest and and so for, they, they were working in that realm so they weren't really looking for someone but they were it ignited their interest just from someone passing on that that one video mm. um, and then they looked into to the album so we released so we signed to a, a label called Flip Knife Records. Um, Frenchy Claude is, is his name. Uh, nice guy, sort of in, small indie label. Um, and we put, we sort of rushed 
our first debut album, which in my eyes was all demos. It was all, they were all demo tracks that, and I listened to it quite recently, actually. And there's some like great songs on there, but it is demos. Like there's, there needed to be edits of like lyrics that are a little bit shit. Some of the, the the recording of it in general is demos, but the songs are really strong. So I think they could tell there that there's something in it. So from that watching that video, the the management have looked into to what we'd had out there in the ether, right? And um, and they love that album. They 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 really love that album. So then, so then they got in touch with us, just just contacting from emails. It, it, sorry, just to go back to the point where there was there was a there was a woman in that worked in the industry, and she worked for she usually does PR. Emily Smith, her name was, and she passed it on to someone that was working at, at Trinifold, and then it, it just sort of went through through that management and they got interested and it's they they wanted they instructed us to say look we want to come and see you live mm-hmm. and we had a we started having a few shows down in london we were getting a bit more notoriety then and uh we did a show in london the first show in london that they sent a few people down and uh as was our luck it seemed to be our luck because we always seem to do things the harder way okay. either by our own fault or just by the nature of, of what we were doing so then we do the show. Guy apparently turns up to the show. We're playing. A, I think we go through the first song, and then fucking electric goes off, fire alarm <laughs> goes off, and the fucking gig gets pushed back to another like hour. So then we try and get back on. Electric's back on. And finally, we we do the gig and we smash the fucking back out of it. Great, loves it. Guy loves it. Okay, someone else from the from the management wants to come and see us. We'll organise another show. Then the second show is at a festival down down south. So we're all traveling down from the north back down to it's down the south of this festival. I think it's like Jamie Oliver's big festival. That's what it was. Oh, right, okay. Which is strange anyway, you know, very sort of calm, calm ethos of a, of a festival. <laughs> uh, and we, we start traveling down there in the van. And then we get caught in like five different fucking traffic jams. And it's like panic. We literally panicking to try and get there. So we're like, uh, an hour late. By the time we get there, we're just fucking. It's stage time, so we've got to get on. You're all buffled, fucking sweaty, and all that. Just crawl, up, jump out the van. And anyway, we do the gig. We play. I think we, do we play just before? Do, do you know the band Dodgy? I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah the band Dodgy. They, they were. They. I remember just playing just before them. Anyway, we go on. Fucking smash the gig again, and we're like, yeah, nothing can stop us. The 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 guy from the the management loved the show again, so we. You know, did everything else. The guy out of Dodgy was like, "Yeah, I really like some of them songs, mate." I said, "You, I don't know whether he was a singer or not, but he was like, you've sort of robbed off Elvis there, haven't you?'" And I was like, <laughs> "Robbed off Elvis? That was nothing like Elvis." But anyway, I'll take whatever you take. And anyway, it was very nice, and we chatted for a bit. But at the same time, I've been chatting with the lead singer of Dodgy. Some of the other lads, they hadn't had a beer, so they were like running. They'd be sweating all day, and they were like. <laughs> We had no riders. They went in the backstage, unbeknownst to them, I think, and just fucking completely demolished all their riders. So <laughs> I mean, Dodgy came off. They were like bastards. The fucking stole our ride. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, but yeah, from there, from there, we went and um, then we had a sit down. We went to the offices right. uh, in 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 London, which is a little bit daunting because it's it's top of a high rise sort of very fancy uh, building. Do you have to do you have to have a wash and get get smart and that kind of stuff? Yeah, we had, we had to get thing, yeah. You know? yeah, no, no, definitely. And uh, and we sat around in, in the offices that are surrounded on the walls by uh, you know Gold Records and people from Led Zeppelin and, and all these and the Who, of course, and you know just the whole walls are full with all all these these, these types of records that we've seen and and have been obsessed with since we were younger. So it was a bit like yeah, we're, we're in it. And um, you know they told us that they liked us and they wanted to see how, how we go with supporting the who. So they, we put us on a few dates around the UK. And of course, the the transition from playing these sort of smaller venues to an arena, mm. you have to learn quite quickly because there is a difference. And if you put if your performance is right and you're close knit as a band, then of course it's gonna it did well. And and I think you know staying true to ourselves, we we. We just grew very quickly of playing in those arena shows, and that was like it, you got the taste of it then. Yeah. So, like, the, I think 
you know, playing and being able to sort of command bigger audiences. Yeah. It's not it's not that easy, but you either you either take it on and deal with it and get better or you know, you fizzle out and you shoot yourself. But no, no, the first gig that we played was it I think at the Echo well, it was the Echo Arena. I think it's the M M S Bank Arena, something like that now. Um and that first gig, everything that could have went wrong went wrong, you know. Okay. I think like uh fucking Guitar string snaps on the first song, and fucking lead guitar, his pants fall down. You know, just fucking <laughs> all. So everyone's like panicking. But I was I, when I remember going on that stage, and where you think you'd be panicking, I wasn't. And I think from then I've never really got nervous. And I think it was like, well, anything if anything goes wrong, it's like it's out of your control. You just got to be able to deal with it. So I like that. I, I, I was like, yeah, if you're in that mindset of being on the stage where anything goes wrong you, you deal with it and because the audience just see every little bit even if you're slightly nervous you know and it doesn't make them feel comfortable about watching a new band so the more comfortable you are the better the more invited the audience are so, so to speak did you get a chance to speak to the who or did they stay out of the way not on the, not the first couple of shows we, we didn't the had of security and stuff but then when we did um well we started getting reactions quite quickly from the from the audience like big big reactions so when when we got invited to do the the american tour that 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 changed the level we went we went up another level from a performance point of view and the who and everyone else that they they could hear it in the audience in the auditorium so in the arena even in the backstage the crowd went fucking mad for us it was like 19 standard standard ovations like all going crazy so of course, they they you know Peter came into our dressing room, and some of the lads have had issues with with visas getting over there in the first place, and we missed the first part of the tour, which was in like New York, uh, Madison Square Gardens. We were like, oh, bastard, you know, got it. But anyway, cut long story short, we got the second half of the tour, which was you know a couple of months. So, um, Pete, when we first got to the first date, I think it was in Toronto. Yeah, Pete came into the dressing room and was like chatting to us and very sweet. And and, and Roger was chatting with Roger and, and Zach. And they were all very nice. Yeah, P, Pino Palladino was playing for them as well then. Um, the bass player who, who I'd known of because he's just a virtuoso fucking excellent musician. Yeah. And um, Any words yeah. of wisdom from these legends? Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I remember it was funny enough because. Oh, just some daft. <laughs> yeah, it's not a daft me in the fucking. Me and the uh, bass player was smoke. We fucking chain smoke like mad. So, and then uh, I remember the uh, Pete saying, I, I, "It took me ages to get off those fucking things, but I'm glad I got off them." The only thing that got him off was uh, was tobacco. You know, chewing tobacco. Oh, and we're like, yeah, I think he's gonna smoke. It's the worst one, Ben. You know, he's gonna keep smoking. <laughs> um, but no, no, it was they, they were they were very nice with us and uh, sort of they were excited for us for the reaction that we were getting. And like people coming back and saying, you know, I've not seen a, a support band like that get a reaction, and and it and it and it was. You could tell we we sell merch after the shows in like a certain section of the arena, and we tell people on the mic and run over. And by halfway through that tour, it's like people running after us and pulling your ear and everything, and fucking like it was like a Beatles moment, really, as a support band. Which it is, which is kind of crazy, you know what I mean? So, um, we enjoy that. <laughs> How do you take to that kind of stuff? You, you strike me as somebody that that enjoys that kind of stuff. Uh, no I enjoy. I, 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 I'd rather enjoy the reaction of like being in the arena. It doesn't really bother me. I, I, I speak to anyone, of course, and do the signature thing's weird because it's like, yeah. why do people want that? I think they just want something from me, I suppose. Um, but no, no, of course, I get it. I get it. Um, but at the time, we were like, yeah, just to sell more fucking CDs. We need some money. So <laughs> nice. <laughs> but, so, um, so slide dig. So 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 the who talk us through the other people that you've played with as well. Then. So we we uh, from that we came back. We did. Uh, we started. We got invited to play the Teenage Cancer Trust with um, at the Royal Albert Hall, um, with Def Leppard, wow. and uh, there was loads of people backstage there. It's all good at the Teenage Cancer Trust. So. You know, we were happy to support a great charity. Mm. And um, the guy, out to, we were speaking to the drummer out of, I can't remember his name, unfortunately. We were speaking to the drummer out of uh, Def Leppard. And he had his he had his parents there who watched the show and the parents loved us and we were like meeting backstage with all them. 
everyone in, everyone at that level is always usually nice. You know what I mean? You can get assholes, but we that was the one thing that we didn't really meet any proper assholes except uh, John Mayer. Yeah, John Mayer, don't like him. <laughs> what did he do? He was chatting up my bird. <laughs> oh, was it? Oh, right, right. Okay, fair enough. Right, okay. <laughs> how, how did that end up then? I fucking didn't see him. I was running around the arena trying to find him. Yeah. No, no, no. Oh, good. He's, he's a good player. He's, he's a great position. I can't take that from him. But no, it's a, it's a funny moment. It's a funny uh, thing with regards to me and John Mayer. And he doesn't even know who he was. I, don't, I, I think he wants to sin us play as well. He had some derogatory term to say about us. Fucking, anyway, John Mayer. That's all. <laughs> I'm purposely leaving a long pause just to, <laughs> just to dwell on that level of it. It's fun. It's part of it, although it, not, not everything's going to be roses, is it? You know, you. No, uh, mate. It, no, it, no. It, 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 it feels oh, like a, just a, like a tiny little blip in an amazing like part of your music career, really, that. Yeah. No, the journey is the journey is as, is as enjoyable as the uh, as the shows themselves, you know. Yeah, it's exactly, exactly. So, so the who then? So, so you play with Def Leppard, Liam Gallagher. Yeah, we went over in 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 Europe and playing at what was the hottest day I've ever experienced in my life in in Milan. And uh, was that where Twisted Fate? No, that was. Uh, Were they on as well? No, no, no. It was it was the Killers. Oh. Killers played as well, uh, Liam Gallagher and um, Richard Ashcroft. So we met Richard Richard Ashcroft, oh, and he was dead nice. And we had sort of mutual friends because he grew up, obviously, he's from Wigan. And, and there, there was a guy, a good long standing friend of ours who's like a juicer, John Kettle. He was in a band coming up in Wigan at the time when Richard was coming up with the, the Verve. And uh, they had like a bit of a to do in like the local press, and they were like fighting for notoriety. and <laughs> Richard had said something in the newspaper and there was like confrontation so we uh, we brought it up and he was there and he was like oh shit yeah, yeah. I forgot about John <laughs> Kelly yeah. he's, he's a lovely guy and a very talented uh, person in his own right um, so that was good and then we were trying to meet Liam but he had like his, two, his entourage was too big so we were like Liam I don't know what but no we didn't get anything um, but I, I remember speaking to the guy out the killers that he was alright I was, I was a bit pissed at the time telling him that he had uh, skinny legs, skinny legs than than our drummer Peter. Uh, but I don't, I, sometimes the Americans don't get our humour, do they not? So yeah, I, think it was, I think it was a bit offended. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was it was a top top show. But it's so hot, it's an extreme. I had a blazer on as well. Oh, that was it. He was telling me the guy at the Killers was like, "How have you just played that sh- full show with it with your full jacket on?" I was like, "I couldn't get my jacket off. It was like stuck <laughs> it's in the body, like." <laughs> entered itself to my fucking body in the gig. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we we then went on to do some stuff with uh, Scorpions, which are a, a bit different than what our musical uh, genre was, so to speak. Yeah. But fuck, they had they had they had uh, a lot of fans. Ma- the massive Scorpions, so playing mm. in Paris and play that it was it was part of the tour. So we were doing the festival season. Then we did some dates. In and around the festival season with Scorpions in Europe, so um, I remember we were we, we did like the the main stage at Isle of Wight, went down in the same day to to France, played the gig in Paris, and the after soon straight after the gig went straight up to Scotland and played like mm. Transmit Festival, I think it is, and then after Scotland went back to fucking France. It was like four or five days of just complete travel madness so but, so so um because obviously you do standing man now so yeah how, how did that band um uh, not be around anymore just talk us through how it ended um so we, we just i think it was a difficult time really from from getting into to people in and around us from the industry and you know we had a we had a booking agent that we just sort of signed to who um who did quite, you know, did he, he understood us, understood what we what we were as a sort of band. And we weren't indie, but we weren't like classic rock. We were somewhere in the middle, and you know, he 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 tried to and did did great things for us of putting on the shows and stuff like that. And, and then it became a little difficult because we, after the Who thing, the the sort of dark side of it was that we didn't really have anyone. Um, on the ground working for us and we were just a little bit naive 
So yeah. obviously coming back from the Who thing, we, we were supposed to have like a tour of the UK and starting our own tour. Mm. And that didn't transpire by the time we got back and by and and too many months had elapsed where where the, the ball had sort of got dropped. Mm. So obviously you're coming back on on what is a, a very successful tour from in the US and got us like a load of fans over there. And then coming back to the England, uh, coming back to the UK, and and nothing really being in place. Mm. So we didn't have, and that's what it is in the music industry. It's like you can't do it on your own. Even if you're the best songs in the world, you have to have the team around you, yeah. and and that has to build, and you have to keep an eye on that. And I think we were, unfortunately for us, we we missed, we we didn't have that full structure of a, mm. you know, a full team around us. I think. That, that cost us and that cost the it cost keeping the, the ball rolling yeah. and then um it becomes a little bit more difficult of like a mentally i think you know you 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 sort of feel aggrieved by by missing opportunities and then um it gets to the point where you know fractions start happening in the band and you you, you think that you know, it just got a little bit too much for me, I think, mentally. And I think for all the other lads in the band, and, you know, we're enjoying ourselves more than than what you really have to do. And, and I think it came to a realisation that if you're doing anything, and especially in the music industry now, it, it's great to think that you're living in the 60s and, you know, you've got people just taking care of everything. But if you're not there, you've still got a graft. And I think we lost that as a group, as a collective, to understand that, that you have to graft a little bit more. You have to be a bit more savvy and understand that the sharks that are in and around will will only lead you down the wrong paths and all that stuff. So, me personally, out, out we were we were playing some of the shows, and I think the last the last show that I was thinking that you know I needed a break from it was we played we were playing with Roger Waters at uh, well he was playing at headline in British Summertime. And we we got on one of the side of the stages just before squeeze, and uh, it was like technical issues, but it was like ridiculous. And I remember looking back, and the guitar tech was distracted chatting to some some Burns, someone else was distracted, and then it just the gig was like it was painful as fuck. Mm. And I remember getting a little bit emotional playing that last song, and I'm thinking I, I need a change here because it's going down the wrong route. And um, you know, a month later, I sort of sat down with the lads and, and said, maybe we need to just stick it on a hiatus at the moment. And 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 not no detriment to them. It's more of where I was mentally, I suppose. If you haven't got the drive to to do it, and it things became harder. So it's like the conversations in the band became harder. You know, trying to mm. trying to solve. Or trying to all see, sing from the same M sheet became harder, I suppose. And I think that was built out of frustration out of all of us, knowing that the you know fucking balls kept getting dropped. Yeah. So I I just um, I I sort of wanted a you know a little bit of a break, and um, and then was visualizing pretty much after that that I have to do something else. I, I, you know, I couldn't still get away from this need to create and fucking drive and do this thing, whatever's it the fuck it is in, inside me that makes me want to great that I have to start something else so so did you go back to like a day job and that kind of stuff then for a bit or... yeah. yeah 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 um but it's, it was pretty hard I've got to say it's like a breakup it's like uh yeah. how I can imagine what uh, a divorce is like to some degree yeah because um and we're all still very close you know we're all still still good mates obviously Peter came with me the drummer out of Sly Diggs and he's in standing man at the moment um but I'm still I'm still Close with uh, with Louis and Ben, the other lads that are in the band. Louis is doing something else now at this moment in time. Nice. He started out a new band. Um, so yeah, we I started thinking about right, just get straight into something else. Uh, so it never so, leaves. You just have to try it again and have, and have another yeah. go. And um, how how do you feel the uh, the transition from um, you know being in Sly Digs into Standing Man? How how's that been for you? Yeah, it's, it's it's strange, really, because you know you've spent all your your career life in in music, 
having certain people that you buzz off and connect with. You, yeah. That was me and Louis, really. We were of the same mindset. Creatively as well, you know, Louis wrote songs as well and I co-wrote with him and wrote on my own all in, in Sly Dig. So not having someone to buzz off and bounce off, that was quite daunting. But then, uh, you know, working with these lads that, that we started standing man with, with was good because it was just a new, fresh, different people. Mm. Now, Paul, the bass player, he'd actually, he'd, he'd taught um, Ryan, the lad out of the K's. Oh, nice. Because Ryan out of the case, he came to America with us. And he, yeah, he, I've, I've had him on the podcast before. He, he, I was going to ask you, he played he played with a Who for a bit, did he? Or, or, yeah, like, yeah. I know you're part but, of it at all. No, it's part, part of Sly Diggs he played. With. Oh, right. It was actually in your band as well. It was yeah, in- yeah. Oh. No, no, it's just that's that's how it, that's his connection with the, with the Who, yeah. Oh, nice. Um, so he, he played he, he played keys over there and came to America with us because that's Ben, the bass player of Sly Diggs. That's his brother. Yes, uh, it's all flooding back because I, I did. Uh, it, it was a uh, over a year or so ago. Last time we we, we talked to Ryan about it, yeah, he's a nice lad, isn't he? Yeah, he's sound blue, <laughs> right? Talented lad. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. Sorry, where was I? I think it was saying yeah, about. We're, yeah, we're just just like transitioning and getting and 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 starting this thing, standing man, man. Yeah. So so I I, I wanted it straight off the bat. I was like, well, I can keep ringing. I know the industry is more design now for like constantly getting uh, content out and all singles, singles, yeah. singles, and EPs. Yeah. And I was sick of EPs anyway. I was sort of getting, I didn't, I didn't, I was like, right, if I'm going to fucking do something, then I want to sort of create a body of work, so to speak. So it was, we started writing different tracks and different songs. And uh, the first sort of batch um, uh, tracks were, were all right, but they weren't what I was looking for. So some of them got scrapped. Yeah. And one or two had this this element of this sort of tinge of psychedelia, which um, it, I, I, you know it was it was interesting to me at the time, and is, and I wanted to create something that was like rock, but also um, this thing that I was going through at the time and listening to different records that I was usually listening to that incited you know just to playing around a little bit with tonality and 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 different effects sound wise and, and push me in the direction to start what would be the journey of recording the, the debut album. Mm. So, um, yeah, so we, the new album's out today. It is out today. Yeah. Finally out there. We waited a long time. That's how long it was. So, I, 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 so how long has it been record finished and recorded, mastered and to release day today? How long, well, how long has that been? From from when it was fucking finished, it was in the everything was in the can and all sorted. It was uh, it's about two years. Wow, we've been sounding for about two years, and that was more from like people in the industry saying, you know, sit on it, don't don't release it, yeah. keep keep tracking on, and and again, it was more of like the, the album is, uh, and as I view it, and certainly this band, it's like it tells the story and it's the start of the story. So yeah, we're not. I'm not releasing this album and fucking looking for album chart charting and anything like that. It's not. It's not the case. We're not big enough at this moment in time for that. Yeah. So I'm not really that interested in in the chart thing. I just wanted to get it out to for people to understand the start of the story, and that's what it all is. All these, yeah. you know, bands and stories, isn't it? So I think it's a body of work that that gives people an understanding of who we are, what we are, and what we're about and um i think it's good to just get it out there so people can go okay you are you've never heard of you and then you've got a full body of work rather than yeah just a couple of singles and something like that i just wanted to do it different yeah so yeah. do you do you listen back to the album a little bit now and want to change anything because it has been two years at all yeah I fucking always want to change things. <laughs> just haunting <laughs> yourself every day like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 massively insecure <laughs> Uh, no, but I, I I listened to the album not that long ago, and uh, I was like, it's fucking really good. I, well, I've given myself a, get, a, a gap from it, yeah. and then go right entirely. Let me just listen to that album. Came across it again in, in the, on yeah. the phone, driving in the car, and then I listened to it in its entirety, and I was like, it's fucking really good. That album, yeah. I really enjoyed it. And then you think about the enjoyment of recording it. Yeah, nice. And um, and I'm glad that you know we can actually get it out. Because it's sort of a little bit of closure as well. Because if you've been sat on an album for two years, and you know you're like fucking hell, we've got to get this album out yeah. at some point. Um, 
and we, we got it out. It is a little bit of a closure. Get it out to the people. It's not yours anymore. Then you know they can they it's up to them whether they fucking like it or not, or listen to it or not. You know, oh, no. but closure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nice. Well, well, one of one of the singles that came off the album, um, "Changing Wind," was picked up by Noel Gallagher, I believe, uh, and that that brought some eyes towards it. Did it get added to some playlist or something? I was reading up on. Yeah, yeah, it got added to like Man City playlist. Oh, nice. Oh. Uh, I think there's only two footballer fans in, in the in the band anyway. <laughs> Me and Joe and both Everton fans. So we were, oh, okay. Yeah. So we're not United fans anyway. So that'd be it was. <laughs> but yeah, no, that was good. It was good to good to see that, you know, the track's getting listened to and, and getting a little bit of uh, notice, I suppose. Yeah, well w- one interesting fact from from the album as well that was brought to my attention before was uh, uh John Squire brought a new song out with Liam Gallagher recently. Yeah. It sounds really familiar to another song that's already been out there. Um, and it happens to be, and, and I've listened to both songs again this morning before interviewing you. Right. He, he's ripped you right off there, Annie Paul. It's, 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 it's pretty, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of similarities to the riff anyway. <laughs> yeah. So. I remember, as, like, soon, it, as soon as the song starts, it's the exact same riff. So your, your song changing yeah. the, 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 the riff on it is exactly the same. Yeah. As, Squire's song, uh, just another rainbow. That riff, a, a yeah, bit, yeah. class riff. Um, but it, it's, it's when you when you do listen to it back, it's just like, wow. It must be nice to have somebody like that uh, ripping you off. But it's funny, isn't it? <laughs> that, like, there's there's only certain realms within music and riffs and genres and melodies yeah. and stuff where there's going to be similarities, inadvertent similarities. Yeah. Right? So you're going to get that. There's many a time I write a fucking song, Bob fucking love this yeah the melody's ace the structure's ace and then like after a while i'll listen back to it and go oh, that's completely that other song i've just realized bastard okay so there is that element it's that not just happen. a riff though it's like the but, the whole melody it's the, yeah. thing, it's the, it's the, it's the, here's the timing of it of the old riff as well it's a bit like yeah well fucking hell if he, if he has done it and, and he has got it and and you know it's a fucking compliment it's john squire and he's great yeah. um, I, I think i think changing winds are fucking much better track anyway. Yeah, yeah no, I, I agree with that. So, can you like like report that kind of? So, who do you who do you report this to? Offstead is there an Offstead for music? <laughs> what would you do the the, 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 the yeah. thing. The, 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 loads of because lots of people came out about it, uh, when it when yeah. it came out. I was like, when did you write fucking uh, my song? And I was like, <laughs> fucking way before he did. Yeah. So that just like put that out there. <laughs> it, it, it was written far uh, like uh, earlier than the. John Squire started penning. What, what I'll do it in the description of this podcast, I'll put a link to both songs and people can. Yeah, make, let, 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 let people um, choose. Let the people decide. They're going to they're gonna say their, their song's better because they've got bigger fans, but I fucking don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, yeah, but like, you know, what a, you know, one of the greatest guitar players in the world. Yeah, man. And John Squire. <laughs> See what I do. <laughs> <laughs> but it, must, it, it must be a nice compliment, if anything. Anyway. Yeah, 100%. I fucking love, like, I love John Squire, I love Liam Gallagher as well. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, pay me a little bit. How much did you get paid for it? Maybe a little bit of royalties. Well, a bit that. Yeah. Didn't go so far, consider yeah, it. Yeah. But no, no, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't chase it and go into <laughs> legal battles of trying to claim anything back. No, I'm not that person. Um, No matter what, even if it was a, a huge hit, yeah. I probably wouldn't do it, even if I was a pauper. It's just not in my uh, vocabulary, so. Yeah. If it is and, it, and it's influenced him, I'm chuffed. Yeah. But either way, man. Well, also, there's going to be a link to uh, in the description of this podcast on YouTube, or if you're listening to it on the audio version, click on uh, click on the link tree as well, because that's because you've got a big tour coming up. You've got the album yeah. out now that we want people to share it. It's going to be on. It's, well, it's on RGM Live right now. Our, yeah. The album, we fucking love it. I think it's great. Um, we're going to be shouting about it. Just talk us through. Um, now it's release day. The album's out. What's it like for you now, having this tour ahead of you, and the album actually out? It must be a relief. Yeah, it's it's, it's a relief. It's just like the starting point of it. I think you know, it's it, it is the is the journey is is really beginning um, for Standing Man. So mm-hmm. getting out and doing our first headline shows is, is exciting. Starting next week in in London on the eighteenth. Nice. Um, but yeah, let's get you know we want to play around the UK and and all those fans that want to see us and. Do those things, but to be able to play the the album and have a longer set, 
you know, a bit more songs from the album, maybe a bit of newer stuff that we're working on. But but being able to go and perform and, and also people where they can find out what the story's about. So that album, I stand by it and, you know, hopefully people like it and love it as much as we did and uh, we enjoyed recording it. It, it must be a really nice space to be now. It must be, it, it, how do you feel now, like confidence wise and, um, you know, having more history within the industry and having that experience with, uh, you know, with the previous band and, yeah, you know, and, and learning from everything that happened there. Are, are you taking all, I, I presume you've got to be taking all that into standing man now and just feeling more confident about things and, and, and knowing, knowing what to do really and uh, how to map out your future as a band now, I suppose it must be. Um, yeah. I, I, I yeah. kind of think there's a question in there. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I know what you're getting at there. I, 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 definitely from the experience point of view, you know, you've, you, you've been through it and, and mistakes are the ones that, you know, you learn from it. Yeah. Not really, you know, there's that saying about, you know, you don't really make mistakes. You, you, you either, you either win or you learn, don't you? So, so yeah. speak, but, I we I've made enough mistakes to understand where there's pitfalls, but there's always new mistakes to make. Yeah, and then there's that other side because it is an industry because it is just the maddest industry in the whole fucking world, mm. the music industry in the respect of you know it's not it doesn't run like the normal business world does so to speak or anything like that, even different arts as well. So <clears throat> there's a there's there's always that element of luck and always that element of people you know, that are, are important that can change the transition of your trajectory um, with a with a flick of a hand, so, so to speak, then we just hope that that gets out to the, to the right people. And it, a lot of it will be luck, but you've still got to be good and you've still got to create good music, otherwise you're not really going to get anywhere, I suppose. But for me, it's more about being able to go and do it again. Uh, that's what I found. After all, you know, experience and all that thing, it's, it's taught me that you've got to enjoy I've got to enjoy the process and not get too lost on, oh, yeah. we've got to make it. We've got to do this thing. Of course, I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't want to make it. Okay. I didn't want to this fucking whatever this make it is. But making it me is is making a make being able to continuously do it and and and, and generate, you know, money for it so you can live. Yeah. But being able to get in a studio and and, and having the, the ability to go and work with different producers and different things and record and do that beautiful process that is recording and then also going to Traveling the world, traveling the world for me is, is is a big fucking thing and always has been, because uh, it's absorbing other cultures and it and it yeah. makes you uh it makes you a little bit more understanding of why we're fucking all here, yeah. you know, to yeah. not get too oh, too right. Um, but well, yeah. Well, congratulations on an amazing album, mate. I am I implore anybody to listen to it. There's a link. I'm going to point you again to the link in the description of this podcast, ladies and gentlemen, uh, where you can download the album. You can buy a ticket for the tour. Just check out the dates uh, all over the country. Is it? Everywhere? Yeah, uh, London, Bristol, uh, Birmingham, Manchester on the 26th, 27th is in Leeds, and then Edinburgh on the 28th. Start something good. There we go. So, it's good. so congratulations on the album, as I say. Um, uh, what an amazing uh, story you've got so far! Let's let's kick off this next chapter in your life, mate. Uh, yes, mate. Back on and just enjoy every minute of it. You're a talented lad, and I've really enjoyed getting to know you, Dean, today. Oh, mate. Thanks very much. Thanks, Carl. Uh, is there anything you want to? That all those people hovering over the link that haven't pressed it yet, mate. What would you say to them? Um, just click on it and dig it, mate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Switch it on and enjoy yourself. Put it on at a weekend or the evening. Go and enjoy it. Nice. Let's know what you think. Dean Ferris, Andy Mann, really appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us today, pal. Have a good one. Cheers, buddy.